Hey. I've got.
Hello. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Yeah. Uh, sir. Okay. Yeah. You need to wear the headphones. Okay. Just for the records, you have to uh, put the headphones to hear me. Thank you so much. Can you hear me at the back? Perfect. Thank you. So uh, a very good morning to you all and thank you for being with us here today at the Resilience Hub. And our session is titling as Nature, People and Climate, Promoting Nature Positive Actions Through Inclusion and Collaboration. And before we start, if you are, if you are to translate uh, this into the other languages, I think there would be a Q QR code coming up. So you can scan that QR code so that you can get the translation on. So with that, uh, I would just like to give a brief introduction about uh, the event, uh, the session that we are having today. So if we began with like 30% of the global forest area has been destroyed since the pre-industrial era. That's what the IPCC and IPBS report says. And keeping this in mind, we have designed today's session uh, when we will be hearing from six different, uh, four different panelists from two regions of the world. So we have people from Nigeria and also people uh, from Bangladesh and they will be talking about the inclusion, uh, the role of youth and also nature positive responses in conserving the natural resources. So the objective of today's session would be, we'll be highlighting on three uh, objectives. So the first, we began with exploring and identifying the innovation on nature positive responses uh, for for uh, conservation efforts where we put the youth in the front line. And then the second objective of today's session would be to understand the role of indigenous people and local, uh, indigenous communities and local people and how we can bring them into the mainstreaming uh, policy making and decision, uh, decision making. And last but not the least, we are also talking about uh, advancing right-based ecosystem approaches where we can integrate this with the national policies, the NDCs, and also the other policies which comes with natural resource conservation. So without further ado, I would like to invite today's uh, uh, moderator for the session and also our esteemed panelist. So I would uh, welcome uh, Ms. Kalyani Inu Mupi. From, she's a representative of the Gambia delegate and she will be moderating the session. And with her, I would also ask our panel members to come up uh, to come up front on the stage, starting with Madhya Choudhury, who is a senior researcher on the uh, at the International Center for Climate Change and Development (ICAD). And our second speaker, we have Mr. Abdul Hamid Tahir Hamid. Uh, he is the Youth Climate Council Global Alliance Nigeria, representing uh, Nigerian delegates here. Then we have uh, Dr. Moklesu Rahman, who is the executive director of CNRS, based an organization based in Bangladesh. Then uh, we have Ms. Juliet Kia Malakar, who happens to be the executive director of the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, another organization based in Bangladesh. And last but not the least, we have Sir Sam Onibulo, a government official delegate from Nigeria. Even though uh, Mr. Sam is not here present, we're respecting him anytime. So with that, I would uh, ask Ms. Kalani to come up and to moderate the session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the... Can you all hear me? Is it clear? Okay. Welcome to the day two of the COP29. I hope you're all having a good time here. So today's panel is definitely a topic, I mean, you know, a need of an hour. I think, you know, the theme is emphasizing on the interconnectedness of environmental sustainability, social inclusion and collaborative efforts, which promoting nature positive actions, advancing practices that restore the super, uh, support the, nat you know, the natural ecosystems rather than degrading them. So when people from various backgrounds, communities and sectors, they come together, I think they can amplify the impact of these actions 
through shared knowledge, innovate solutions, innovative solutions, and collective commitment. I hope you all agree with me. So, so today we're going to explore briefly, uh, yet uh, you know where needed comprehensively. How are we going to do this, and what will be the final key takeaways? So, thank you to Savoy for uh, introducing to the panelists uh, uh, um, once again. So, I'll straight away get into the dialogue. So, starting with Madhya Chaudhary. Madhya, um, over to you. So, in your experience. So Madhya, in your experience, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, you encountered in the intersection of nature, climate, and people? Do you want to share that? Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for the introduction. Um, just to reiterate, I am Madhya Chaudhary and I'm working as a senior researcher at the International Center for Climate Change and Development, which is based in, which is a think tank based in Bangladesh, and I'm basically looking after the nature, people, and climate program at the center. So. Um, just to how I see this question uh, posed at me is that I see it more of kind of like setting the scene for the rest of this session. So I'll try my best to not go into giving up any solutions, but rather focusing on the challenges that we're facing at the intersection of what we have, the nature realm and the climate realm. So let's look at this from two angles, which are very basic, that uh, climate change is either directly or indirectly having adverse impacts on nature, which encompasses the ecosystems, biodiversity, and the services and goods that we're receiving from them. And the second angle would be that nature, these ecosystems and biodiversity themselves can help us fight climate change because they have the capacity to mitigate and allow us to adapt to climate change. Now, from that context, it has already been established by the science that biodiversity and ecosystems are severely being impacted by climate change. And the Paris, according to the Paris Agreement, we are trying to limit our global warming temperature to two degrees centigrade. And the science says that if we do touch two degrees, one in 10 species will be at risk of extinction. And with three degrees, it rises up to 12%. Now, Fortunately or unfortunately, most of the biodiversity hotspots are located in the global south, where we have most of our least developed countries and the small island states. These are also one of the most vulnerable nations to climate change. And these are also one of the nations which are most, have one of the poorest uh, populations. And these people are mostly dependent for their livelihoods and natural resources. So we have a major conflict here where they're very highly rich in ecosystems and biodiversity in the global south. The people of these region are also highly dependent on these natural resources. We also have the global north's demand depleting our resources in the global south. Now, coming with that intersection in light, moving into the challenges that we're facing when we're working in this interconnected realm of nature and climate, Firstly, in the LDC's context, it would be to strike a balance between economic development and uh, conservation, because these are also LDCs which are trying to graduate and improve their GDPs. And there is a direct imbalance or there's a direct trade-off between when we're trying to develop economically, which is putting in more infrastructures, and we're trying to conserve our natural resources. So for example, in Bangladesh, we have approximately 45% of the population dependent on agriculture as their primary livelihood resource. But at the same time, the urbanization rate is almost 3.2% per year, which means that by 2030, almost more than half of the population is going to live in urban areas. So how do we strike a balance there where we're trying to conserve our nature to be able to mitigate and adapt to climate change and at the same time improve the livelihoods or the daily or the quality of life of the people? That's one major challenge that we're trying to... And with regards to that, inclusion of indigenous people and indigenous knowledge and local communities in our practices is another major challenge that we're facing in the global south and even at a global level because 
There are no policy frameworks that integrate the views of indigenous people and their knowledge, which is very much vital for protecting natural resources. So we are largely dependent on scientific approaches right now. What we pitch for is that our practices are informed or our policies are informed by the local community's knowledge in an equal amount as much as it's involved, informed by science. With Trading, trailing from that, another major challenge would be coordination across the different sectors and scales, both at the local level or local government level and at the national policy level. Because nature and climate cross cuts with multiple sectors, transgressing from agriculture, health, and water, and etc. And that means we have multiple stakeholders involved here who have conflicting priorities who need to work together, who need to be on the same table. And more often, it's very difficult to achieve that, which delays our achievements in line with our ambitions. And with that regard, this is not just a problem if just at the national, at the local level or the uh, sectoral level at the national scale. It's another problem that even transgresses at the global because we just had the Convention on Biological Diversity COP, which has pitched for a joint work program, and this has been a pitch for since strongly since COP27 that the UNFCCC COP, which deals with climate change, and the CBD COP, which is dealing with biodiversity and ecosystems, need to have a joint program for bringing on their efforts together and to try and the, the discussions where there are controversies is how do we avoid duplications of efforts here. So that challenge transgresses at the national scale in terms that parties which are members of the CBD COP are required to uh, submit nationally biodiversity, uh, NBA SAPs, National Biodiversity Strategic Action Plans. And it's in very few countries that these NBSAPs are aligned with our national adaptation plans and our NDC. So moving to the introductory fact that I said that nature has a very strong ability to both mitigate and adapt to climate change, but our national plans are not reflecting them because our NBSAPs are not integrated with our NAPs and NDC. So bringing in coordination at both global, national, and at the local level across various sectors is another challenge. That, and I would like to close this with a final challenge. Of course, last but not the least, funding. Funding is always a challenge. Funding is a challenge across all sectors. But with the nature and climate intersection, what we'd like to highlight is how do we, because the nature, based on UNEP's latest nature finance report, we almost need globally trillions of, there's a trillion dollar gap for nature positive action. And at the same time, at national or local levels, we have significant gaps, especially in these developing countries, in data which can inform the need for conserving nature in light of climate change. So for example, when we're talking about the loss and damage fund, which is being operationalized, and we go into specifics of ecological loss and damage, how do we attribute how much of these ecosystems and biodiversity have been damaged or affected due to climate change so that we can draw uh, contributions or money from the loss and damage fund towards protecting the nature and there's a significant data gap there. So how do we channel these funds? How do we merge? Because the, we also have the global biodiversity framework which is being implemented. How, and we have missed our IG targets both in the previous uh, target years. So with COP30 upcoming at Bellum, which is going to have a strong uh, impact or a focus on nature and climate intersection, how do we ensure that these efforts are aligned? With that, I'd like to close my... Thank you. Thank you so much, Mada. So, uh, Hamid, over to you. So, from your experience and work with the Africa Union Council, Green Wall Initiative, and the Youth Climate Council Nigeria, what are the key challenges do young grassroots innovators face in, in centering the equity and justice in nature-based solutions across Africa? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, my name is Abdul Hamid Sahir Hamid. I serve as the president of the African Union Great Green Wall Youth Advisory Board and at the same time the chairperson of the Youth Climate Council in Nigeria. So actually for the almost a decade of experience that I have in this uh, issue, 
there is a lot of uh, Sabara challenge for the young innovative ideas for more especially in the developing countries. As some of you may know, the, the Great Grower Initiative is the Fan African uh, Initiative by African Union, which has to do with the drought and desertification. So in terms of the nature based solution, actually, there is a lot of uh, challenge that young people are facing. For more especially when it comes in terms of the financial spot, like the, the, for the implementation of the project, because there is a lot of ideas, and uh, yes, there is a lot of ideas we can find, but, the, what, but how we can implement those ideas to work. And again, one issue of the GAF, because of the capacity building. Most of young, talented people will have it in most of the African countries now. A lot of them, and they are really passion committed how they can spot, but lack of uh, spot that they are getting, for me especially in terms of mentoring, training them, how they can bring solutions their, to their community, and how, how they can, to know their own technical know-how. And again, the next point that we can also see, the another challenge is the barrier of the policies. In most of the African countries or developing countries, we can find a lot of young people, they are pushing. For example, let me give you an example of myself, or what I'm doing so far for almost a decade, as, as I said, <clears throat> working on the issue of the climate change, how we can bring this nature based the solutions. But the inclusive the government, they are not giving us a room to bring young people ideas or young people perspective so that they, so that is the major challenge for the also policies. We have to look for the policies. The young people are facing the challenge for the, their voices in terms of decision making because most of our parliament, yes, is there, but we can see that young people, they are not in the part of decision making, even their contribution is less. So these are the challenges that I see young people are facing in this regard. A lot of works we can find young people are doing on their own individual communities, trying to, but there is no more kind of spot that they can implement to upscale those really initiatives that they have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hamid. Uh, that was insightful. Uh, Dr. Rahman, um, uh, over to you. From the Bangladesh context, can you please share your experience at both the national policy and at the grassroots level? Why do you think the local inclusion and power dynamics at the community level matter in conserving nature, and how can it be linked to the policy sharing? Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for giving me the space for saying something based on my experience or our experience. Uh, in Bangladesh particularly. Um, i just like to uh, highlight about the diversities first uh, when talking about the inclusion thing. If you consider the nature, I mean, there are different types of ecosystems and biodiversity. And this also varies by a kind of place-based situation. So in the coastal area, we have a different types of ecosystems. In the hill slopes, uh, in the riverine systems, in the uh, ocean systems. So there are lots of diversities. And if you consider the people, uh, even in the same village, they are not homogeneous. They are highly heterogeneous in terms of their occupation, culture, economics. And if you consider the climate thing, it is also there are also diversities. We have different types of weather extremes that are impacting us, slow onset. Uh, drivers impacting us and this impacts also vary by the social and occupational groups and there are other important things that we uh, I often flag that with the contextual drivers sometimes we observe that the contextual drivers are more damaging to ecosystems and to people's livelihood than the uh, climate as adversities so, uh, in planning the adaptation, I would highlight that we need to consider these diversities at, this, at the people, nature, and climate things. Um, uh, the question of inclusion, if we, if we say it is highly needed, but uh, our policies are not very much aligned and not very clearly uh, delineated that how these uh, diversities can be included. 
giving one example, like, you know, Bangladesh uh, is a riverine country and it, uh, we have uh, a long uh, coast a coastal area and uh, most of the people's livelihood is fishing dependent. And when we plan uh, our policies, when we talk about the fisheries or the fisher support, then we consider the fisher as a single unit, those who depend on fishing. But in the coastal area, I have seen that five different groups of fishing communities. A group going to the sea for 10 to 15 days trade for fishing, even more than that. And some people in group, they go for three to five or seven days. Some people go for day trip, and some people are dependent on crab fishing. And there are women and children that they're dependent on the catching of the shrimp juvenile for the aquaculture sector. But we, when we plan for the adaptation for the fishing communities, then we have a single type of support systems. But these people have different level of exposure to climate adversities. And they have a different uh, type of vulnerabilities. And they have different choices and preferences for adaptation. So our adaptation policies or related other policies like water, environment, uh, fisheries, uh, agriculture, they are isolated, segmented, not aligned. So that's a big problem. So uh, when we talk about the inclusion, it is what? Like what NAP is developed and approved. I think it's a very good document, very comprehensive. But people were consulted, but how about the implementation phase? How they would be included in the processes? What would be the aspects of co-creation of knowledge and co-designing the interventions at the ground level? Because especially the systems are different. So that type of thing is not delineated in the, in the uh, national documents like NAP and other policies. And uh, so what happens as usual, as you said, the, the local power dynamics, the powerful people actually they get the opportunities. They have very strong hold and they have very good relationship with the agencies, actors, while the mass people, the huge number of poor, they are excluded from the planning and then implementation or execution. They are considered mayor as a beneficiary or the target groups. So that is the kind of as usual practice uh, which is uh, actually a kind of barrier to achieve the goal or intention or the uh, kind of benefit of the adaptation interventions. Uh, giving, uh, say, power dynamics, if we talk about that, that the fishing thing in the coastal area, which is a major livelihood option for many people, it is controlled by the very powerful people, money people. They actually control. The other thing, the policy implication I considered and I presented in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, that People dependent, uh, the, the people from the four districts depend on fishing in the Sundarbans area, but there are seven fishing bans imposed by the government. So around 60% days, they are sitting idle because of the fishing bans. So what we need is that, why these fishing bans? Why it is decided top-down way? Why not we have a kind of collective decisions include people that, well, we need fishing bans for the sustenance of the fisheries, but we should jointly decide that when it is needed and how many days and how many months and what sort of, where, where it should be the banned areas. So that's kind of hegemonic, and it is the people, they're bound to follow this. So the conservation thing has no human face. It's a big problem. So for whom the conservation is? So that that aspect is missing in our planning processes. Uh, the other aspect of uh, exclusion, that government, of course, has a policy in the coastal area, there is huge canal networks. This year in 2024, we have the highest rainfall, highest. I think in the last 30 years, I couldn't remember that we had this sort of rainfall. And and the 100% seed beds of the monsoon rice damaged. And in the coastal area, farmers largely get one crop a year. 
which is the monsoon rice. In the dry season, salinity rises, they cannot grow crops. But this crop is damaged. So if you ask people, they would say, well, rainfall. If you ask the next question, why not the rainwater is drained out quickly? Then they would say, or they say, that because of the policy, the canal networks are leased out to a few people for aquaculture. So they're segmented, converted to croplands, aquaculture ponds, and that's actually delayed the drainage process. So the policies need to think that where we, we need leasing and this sort of allow people to do uh, the, the degradation of the canal networks. And the canal could have been a very good source of fresh water. And if you can store the fresh water in the canals, then people can use this water for dry season agriculture and also aquaculture. And uh, so uh, instead of remaining the land's fellow, huge land remaining fellow in the dry season because of salinity, the scarcity of fresh water, canal is a good choice. And we demonstrated joint with ICAD in some areas. We rehabilitated canals, stored the rainwater, and engaged the farmers, engaged the Department of Agriculture Extension, and they diversify crops. The life changes in that villages. So the scenario changes so from gray to green. And we call it the uh, kind of blue-green infrastructure. So water systems, the blue thing and green thing. So there's a need for integration of the agriculture department, the fisheries department, and the, uh, the water department or ministries. But they are working in, in silos. It's a big problem. And this power thing, the, most of the canals are elite captured. We have just finished one study on, with the IMI and IRI on elite capture of canals, the water systems. So this sort of information are missing in the policies, missing in the national planning documents. And it is also missing that there are options. People have good knowledge that how could they better manage their resource systems, their ecosystems, and how can they uh, be more resilient. But the question is, it needs their planned orientation and eng engagement in the processes, not only the developing the NAP documents or other documents, but also in the implementation processes and considering the diversities. Otherwise, it's very difficult. I'm giving one example of the youth engagement, which is very important, and nationally it is also important. We have seen the regime change uh, because of the youth movement. Um, in the coastal area, this canal restoration, um, we actually organized the youth to uh, contest these leasing systems. And to do that, we, need, we, we did some capacity bridging things because many of the youth are not well aware about the policies and institutions. So we oriented them on that. And through joint movement of the youth at the front line and the communities, they created huge pressure on local administration. And there are instances that at least three candles were leased free. The government said, okay, no need for lease and let the people use it, use it for their own benefits. So the youth can be uh, very good, definitely, in making changes, but they need to be well-oriented. They need to have better understanding. So this capacity bridging and movement building, these things to be integrated in the process of adaptation, if you really want it. Um, i like to end here, and then uh, uh, what I wanted to say, not funding, everybody's talking about funding. I'd like to highlight adaptation readiness. We are actually not ready. Our policies are isolated. Our understanding has problems. Our institutions are not working together. Coordination is a big problem. And we are not addressing the diversities at the society level, at the climate level, and at the natural systems level. So adaptation readiness is first, and then funding. If we have funding and we are not ready, the money will be wasted. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahman. So over to Ramata uh, Udrago. <coughs> so over to Juliet Kaya Malaka, um, who's an executive director of Christian Commission for Develop in ba Development in Bangladesh. So um, Juliet, from your experience working at the community level, 
how can IPLC's perspective in tackling climate risk regarding the nature conservation be mainstreamed and reflected in national development plans, especially in LDCs? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, we have been listening to the challenges that we are facing in the least development countries and also in Bangladesh. And let me tell you that the organization I'm representing, Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, it's, it's a national organization. They're working closely with the communities. And uh, so we are very close to the communities looking at the, the challenges, the daily challenges and the survivals. So uh, in tackling the climate issues, uh, working with the IPLC people, uh, we, as a community people, we fear that, we hear that, and we experience that. There is a crisis of real acknowledgement, because you know, in, 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 in the world today, it's about less than 5% of population are in, you know, from the indigenous communities, but they actually do, do the stewardship for about 80% of biodiversity and ecosystem around the world. And not only that, they're about taking care of 25% of land and globally. So if we see the contribution, the first thing from the community that lack is that the proper recognition, that the, they care, they, they do stewardship and the, uh, for the biodiversity and ecosystem. So uh, I think um, though in Bangladesh about their about one percent and a little above than one percent population are living in the are living uh, from the indigenous communities. They're from the indigenous communities and ethnic communities, and uh, there are about 54 groups we are having in Bangladesh. The interesting thing is their high concern, high concentration of this this ethnic community and indigenous groups are in mostly in Chittagong hill tracts and some of the coastal lines. They're also living and also in the middle. Though they are living in a in a most uh, well, I mean more climate heat areas, uh, but they are still having limited access to the basic human rights. Not only that, though their survival is very much dependent, their tradition, their culture, their livelihood is very much dependent to, to the nature, and they are taking care of the nature. But investments are very low to them to support. Uh, and to survive the, uh, you know, all through this climate crisis. So my first point is in recognizing the community voice of the IPLC and believing in them. It's not that all the resources, since we do have all the resources internationally, the knowledges are kept also with them. We also need to believe in their capacities as well. Second thing is also, as we heard about this, we really need to include them in, in decision-making discussions. It's like nothing about us without us. You know, when we're doing local adaptation plan, or, uh, you know, we already have done the national adaptation plans, uh, we strongly feel that bringing them on the table and listening to them in their language, not like in the you know really politically correct language, but from their own language, from their own challenge, that matters most. And if we can do that, that will also reduce, in you know, reduce the generalization of their need. Because we have, when we talk about IPLC, as we already heard, it's a very diverse area in terms of their need, in terms of their tradition, in terms of their culture, and also, uh, you know, uh, their total survival in this community. So we strive when we request that the, you know, even the global goal of biodiversity cannot be achieved if we cannot bring them on the table in the decision-making process. And we, when we talk about this inclusive, inclusiveness, unfortunately, some countries, mostly in the least development countries, we are still struggle to acknowledge them as an, you know, the one of the most important actor on the table, and to include them from their own perspective, it's that self determination that we miss. We somehow, as I said, that we have always somebody to decide for them, but it is, it is their self determination. It is their need. They need to, you know, speak out about this. So this is, their, the whole, involvement and their inclusiveness needs to be really addressed. And finally, oh, and also the capacity building. We talk about a lot of capacity building from the perspective of, you know, as, an, as that 
that as an outsider, they need to be sensitized, they need to know what their need is. But I think, uh, but we feel, we experience from the community is that they already have a lot of traditional knowledge, customary knowledge, and this, for centuries they have been surviving in the communities with those climate adversities, with those diff different adversities. So when we talk about climate, uh, when we talk about capacity buildings, I get a little, you know, somehow one step back. I mean, what do you mean by that? It should be capacity sharing. That I, I really appreciate our previous speaker said, there should be a bridge, there should be a bridging, you know, in the knowledge that is the local people having and also, also and, and the science having right at this moment. And finally, of course, investment and financing. And when you talk about financing, we really talk about an equitable, a flexible mechanism, not really highly, you know, mechanized, highly politically correct, highly a bureaucrat to some extent, and also self-determined financing. So I'll stop right there. And when we talk about youth, I would also, since I'm also from Bangladesh, this is the high time when we can include youth to really make a change at every sector. And so it goes same way when we want to include IPLC there because they have a huge, a significant percentage of youth ready to join in the whole process. But unfortunately, we are still failing to do that. So this, is, this will be our call to include the local community, the IPLC, and acknowledging, acknowledging them as IPLC, not in other languages. So, uh, I will stop right there. That would be what we'd expect. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you so much to all the, uh, you know, my esteemed uh, uh, panelists. To the, to the audience now for the, any questions uh, before we end this uh, panel discussion in the next five minutes. Yeah, there are the one, two, three. Yeah, starts from here. One, two, three, four. Yeah, okay. Do you want to go from here? Thank you and wonderful discussion. So I will just uh, ask a question from ma'am's uh, speech last. Uh, ma'am, you were saying that we need to include them with their voice. So uh, do you think that we, uh, the, with the youth organizations and the CEOs, this is high time that we need to advocate to include them in a formal process, in a you know more systemic process, and what can we do for this? Thank you. Shall I just go on? I think you're absolutely right on. You know, um, as we say, this is the high time to include them. And when you talk about include, including them, it means including, in, including them in the formal table. And now what can we do? Then you say that we might need to support them to speak out the way we accept on the table. It's not, that, it, it's not the right one. Uh, I'm very skept skeptical about using the word right or wrong. It's the word we are, ex you know, we always expect in COP and in a formal discussions. But at the same time, I think the readiness of us is also very much required to listen to them in their in their voices, in their languages as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so my question is like, uh, we have a youth-led organization and we have a nature-based uh, adaptation solution in Mehendigons. You know, uh, I'm from Bangladesh. So Mehendigons is one of the most climate vulnerable area and this year, uh, including this year, we had to face uh, more than six to 10 flood, uh, regular flood. So like the pond fish cultivation uh, is like uh, hampered there. So uh, youth from Mehendigons, it's like totally youth-led and in from grassroots community we have an initiative where we uh, utilize the pond as a like uh, we transform the pond uh, with like plastic drum and uh, bamboos and uh, in fish case we cultivating fish so it's a, a wonderful initiative uh, we are getting the result in hand and at the top we cultivating uh, vegetables as well uh, the problem is like our work is great we are doing in good way community has accepting this but problem is funding like we when we uh, implementing this like we implemented in three points so now we are planning to like uh, extend this in others communities as well but problem is like uh, everyone is talking about like youth are not uh, doing in 
practical action. So when we you are trying to do the initiative like projects or initiatives, that time we are not getting the enough funding. So how can we overcome this uh, funding issues? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will try to do this. I'm more as a community voice, and not a, from a you know technical person. Maybe, maybe Dr. Manzur would uh, reply this best. But I would say, first of all, congratulations what you are doing. And I think in Bangladesh and also in the in the globe and the you know who are actually observing Bangladesh, they can never say that youth are not being able to do things. So we have reached a milestone. Now uh, regarding this, how uh, regarding this financing. This is also, I think Bangladesh government is, has already um, started to include youth intentionally. So uh, the youth uh, projects can be you know, recognized, acknowledged, and so, we, so uh, this way they could be funded. So I would, uh, from my perspective, I will just give it to Dr. Munzur also. I'm right, Dr. Munzur, right? Dr. Rahman. Dr. Rahman. So um, is that... Uh, we we will be more advocating for this, you know, for youth getting finances. And I think, uh, so government, uh, as they are trying to do, we will be trying to, uh, you know, be a voice, the youth, you know, to take you there. And you will be presenting yourself as in the voice. So this is our advocacy, you know, way of advocacy that we should do. But from the perspective of the local policy, uh, Dr. Rahman, would, uh, if you could give us some advice on this. Um, I think uh, I would prefer, based on my experience, that youth group, we like to see them as activists, make waves and achieve changes that people need. And this youth group is also dynamic, it's not permanent. Because they are students, most of them are students, they will get jobs, they will be transferred to other areas. but the youth group should organically grow. A cohort will leave and then another cohort will join. So it should be, I would prefer them at non-formal, not registered, not closed space. It should be an open space and focus is making change. Focus is, you know, uh, clear pressures to kind of right-based right -based approach and claim the legitimacy and entitlements. So the funding and the youth group, if they are engaged in funding and then doing the adaptation activities, I think their focus will be distorted or disturbed. It's my personal opinion, I'm sorry about that. Um, their major task is to make waves. And they should help people to get funds by creating pressure, because government has lots of funds pressure so that the right people can get funds to do things. But definitely you can do some innovative things because you have good ideas. Like we are using the Team B approach where my colleague is sitting there laughing that the youth people are reporting with documentations using the mobile phones and informing the government and also the project people that what is happening in the biodiversity and ecosystem services. So that's that's very important. They are generating information from the field because the, the number of yours is huge. Yeah? So they can catch up the diversity, what is happening and where and what should be done. So that information is very useful. So I, I think uh, my, I answered the question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more questions? I think we only have five minutes to go. We can just take only two questions and uh, we have to close this. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, very nice discussion and thanks to the panelists. Just one thing, we have heard a lot of things about the challenges, about the policy gaps, but whatever uh, policy we have, what is the governance systems nationally or globally in national resource management? So uh, my question is to uh, Mukhlis sir or uh, the young lady. Well, I, uh, I just can say a few words like the natural, so the international thing like COP, it's got 29, so 29 years gone. So if we consider the investment, the carbon footprint, and the achievements, where we are. It's like court in Bangladesh. You know, the, if you have the court case, it should continue. You, you will start and then your son will maybe end that. So um, what is your question? I mean, 
Can you just repeat this? The governance system. Oh, governance system is another a kind of very uh, kind of uh, difficult things, and changing. It's a government is monolithic. They are they maintain they want to maintain the status quo. When they design the policy, they think about the political gains rather than community's benefits, and it is actually difficult because these institutions, these agencies have their own policies and they have their own targets. And policies lack strategies and actions. So there are a scope or a space for distortion of policies. So unless we have policies aligned to other elements, like for wetlands, we need water policy, environment policy, biodiversity policy, agriculture policy, fisheries policy together. There should be a close alignment. It's not there. So that's what the problem is. So, I mean, it should take a long time. We are raising these issues. We are generating evidence from the field and transforming this to the uh, policy stakeholders. But we have to wait. And again, the youth force is needed to create pressure on the policy stakeholders to develop the right policy and ensure that the policies are not at the shelf. It should be executed properly. Thank you. Uh, I think we can only take one question and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Let me add. Let me, yeah, let me add what uh, your question, I think. Uh, we need actually policies, policies that also can be uh, integrated because that is the major challenge. Like, for example, now in Nigeria, I know that some House of Assembly, we as a young people, we used to encourage some House of Assembly to bring policies because before then they don't have the policies. And after, if, if we have the policies, so we can start thinking, okay, the implementation of those policies. policies. Because I know that now, well, well, around 10 to 5, sorry, 10 to 8 House of Assembly, because we have the different type of the House of Assembly. We have the National House of Assembly and the State House of Assembly. And this, they are with their own backing spot, with the young people engagement or involvement, they used to bring them on board so that they, they, they stitch its own has its own climate policy. Thank you. Okay, one last question and that's it. Sawa. Yeah. Uh, yes, so to, to Hamid, um, in some countries like in Sierra Leone, governments try to set up youth systems in a sort of cosmetic ways to just maybe in platforms and say we support in young people but then mostly these are the young people that they know that they can control the narratives with and so these are not young people who can actually voice out the concerns of grassroots and local communities and so how are you able to penetrate such politically motivated systems in a sort of a way that you can get the voices that actually matter, that are not controlled by stakeholders, that can actually bring the youth voices to the table? And in another way, we've seen also the youth movement to be sort of very elitist. Those of us who can come to cops, those of us who can, you know, write, those of us who can speak of our, for ourselves, try to leave out the perspectives of the local communities, the local youth that cannot uh, be well represented. How are you able, from the Nigerian perspective, from your experience working in Nigeria, how are you able to ensure that these local youth, these young people from indigenous communities, from the rural communities, get their voices reflected in the positions he presents to governments and the stakeholders. Okay, thank you very much for your wonderful question. And um, actually, as, as someone that I'm working with the grassroots, uh, with a lot of experience, I know that this is something that actually difficult for more especially like developing countries like Nigeria, but it has to do with collaborating with these voices with the stakeholders. That's why, as I said, when we come for the establishment of the, the policies, the climate change policies in our state, we used to approach the state level before reaching to the federal level. Because if you have the, if you have the state level, definitely the things which will be penetrated to the grassroots level. So for, for us to have the voices, you know, it is not just about whether we are, we are staying here or we are, we are talking here. It's about people from the grassroots. So we need to take their own point of view 
so that at least can accommodate or can, can, can align with the policy that also make an impact. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, do you so I do you want to say the closing remarks? Yeah? Or shall I continue? Okay. So very quickly, I think we, we explored why collaboration and inclusion matters. And uh, we also uh, discussed how, you know, it ensures that all voices, which we all have here, you know, it's a great diversity today. Um, who are often marginalized, are uh, heard and valued today, I think. The, this leads to solutions that are more equitable and uh, culturally relevant as well. Collaboration maximizes resources, fosters innovation and ensures that efforts are comprehensive and impactful. So together, these principles can drive transformative change that aligns human well-being with the health of the planet. So uh, I think the panelists are alive for any more questions if you want to uh, post a discussion. But thank you once again for your uh, valuable time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for joining our session.